not a religion or, uh, or faith or, I don't know, our language is looked at as a commodity. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a governance. I, I believe my own language is our governance and governed by the spring, fall, winter, summer. And we don't do anything without that governance. In, uh, we, welc uh, uh, we welcome you to our realm. And this house, uh, this outside house here, uh, Learning Center, is, is part of our part of our temple and part of our belief. And those two journeys, our belief and uh, temple of understanding, is remember yesterday I introduced us not samat. We are one, the mind and the heart journey. So our governance is. Um, uh, I find uh, from working as Environment Network Chair for BC and uh, representative for the Teachers Union in uh, international for 24 countries, meetings from 1980 to current every two years, as well having been worked at United Nations, I find that uh, over from 1988 attending, and my last assignment was 97. And being a broadcaster for 38 years, on radio and TV broadcaster for five years, uh, acting teacher for uh, eight years, and curriculum for culture enrichment for college, uh, elementary schools for eight years, concert producer for eight years to promote BC tourism. Uh, active creator, a co-founding member of the February 14th Memorial March. And we're uh, invited to co-host World Peace and Prayer Day 2022 in Vancouver. Um, we're very active family members and our governance comes from putting these two journeys together. And we're not allowed to move without the grandmother's consensus. In our governance, all is built from the umbilical cord up and we hire men to be our speakers. They're not allowed to say what they want to say. <laughs> um, and they, uh, when we have a gathering like this, we go to Montana, Washington, all our seven dialects of Salish and invite them for four years to be able to pronounce, say my name in public. So the language is that crucial and the honor of those I'm going to honor to say my name that I prepared for four years and went to Montana, Washington, Oregon, BC and say, hey cousin, we're having a naming. We're going to name the president here. We're on four years and we invite you. So in his territory they have clams and crab and oyster surrounded by it, so naturally he's going to bring that to the table in four years. Then I'm going to go say, well sister, um, I'm going to have a meeting for my new son, the president, who will invite you in four years. And she's in Montana, what did they have? Duck, geese, giant rabbits, so they can bring that to the table. And so previously, they had a naming or memorial or honoring, and I gave them 40 salmon. I'm on an island, so we're surrounded by salmon. So for 40 years, I gave salmon to her table, and it's all written down right here, the governance house. And so they remember that, and they remember, uh, you know, the salmon comes from our island, so they put that up and they, uh, we're the first co-op. We're the co-op. We exchange. Series Monetary fund is the church, the temple of our governance. So we remember by honor. And remember yesterday we sat uh, at, at welcoming and honoring you all. Acronyms. Healing our nations of united resistance to apathy. Mm -hmm. So in our governance we have the seasons the four directions, the four age lineage, 
um, tiny tot, teens, adults, and grandparents. And so all uh, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, great seven generations decide. Nowadays we don't live that long, seven generations used to be living here in 50 years ago, but now, you know, our elders used to be 110, 120. In a short 60, 70 years from World War II, we're so disease-ridden from the environment, from the air, from the land, the water, and that has no prejudice. Uh, the infections in the land, air, and water. So we all, my, my Muslim nephews and, and uh, Portuguese grandchildren and my Hawaiian uh, nieces, you know, uh, that environmental damage and uh, the damage, the uh, infestation of the brain, all that knowledge that's slammed at us. And, you know, the kids are like these now talking to the sibling next door or messaging <laughs> mom in the kitchen. And mom saying dinner, what's your favorite dessert? Oh, shut up, I'm texting you. I'm telling you, I told you already. <laughs> you know, is that true? <laughs> and so where's the four directions, right? So they're connected to this lust, this, uh, I don't know what a, a word. It disconnects us from reality. So although I'm premature and born at four months old, and RCMP and uh, my dad were fighting over hunting rights and my mom got sandwiched. And so I was connected to technology for nine months in the incubator, so I love technology. When I learned that, hooked up to the wires for nine months in the incubator before mom could hold you, but still, 196 chiefs for the first time since 1880 met in prayers for that hunting trial. They had RCMP guns at them, city police guns at them uh, uh, for feeding the nations, doing the potlatch, doing the feeding, the care that we're all talking about, caring, sustaining the family, the health of the nation, the strength. So all that come from harvesting the seasons, northwest, east, south, permission by the sun, permission by the moon's tide to give life, to have the sacredness of the womb, the woman's sacred time of life, the month, to create children, for man to learn the pain of the body and the bone splitting of a new birth. But no, they'll never learn it because they're mad. <laughs> so they're there catching the baby and, and, and how many are parents here? How many are not? How many are grandparents? How many are great grandparents? So you feel the love of a new birth. How many have siblings have younger ones? How many did not witness a newborn baby or in their aura? Mm -hmm. So new birth is every day. The umbilical cord cleaning is every day by our governance, by the seasons, by the sun, by the moon. We govern everything. When do we go fishing? In the summer when it's bright and hot? No, we're getting a bikini tan. <laughs> or wait for the rain and the right time of the September to, for the rain, you know. The salmon are just like a river. You could walk across the salmon's backs. They're so thick. You pick berries in October? No! You're busy jumping out of the water. It's too cold. So you're picking berries in June by permission of the sun by permission of the moon, by permission of the land. And so we have to connect ourselves, reconnect ourselves. We're so disconnected in the, <laughs> I told you what my favorite dessert is. I texted you. Or somebody's at the door, I phoned, there's an emergency. Yeah, I got it, they're already over on their way to the hospital. You know, so it creates a different attitude 
So I'm really grateful for you all. It, it, my, the tools of my ears, it appears that you're, uh, to me, that you're engaging in the listening of the wind, the, the feeling of the land. Uh, looking for something. So that's how we are as newborns, looking for that first breath of air, and I feel like you took... You know, when I was prejudiced against college and university degrees, and I was scared I would fail, you know, I never didn't want to fail my elementary school either. I wanted to pass. And, and, and I wanted to feel the celebration of graduating, so I feel that here, that, that you're humble, is, is graduating to a new element, but it's not new, it's back to the umbilical cord. So I like to uh, thank the four directions and thank the four seasons and thank your four lifespans of your lineage that got you this far. Uh, when um, 196 nations here were banned, we were shot at. We were hung in prison in Ocala, New West. We were banned in the women's penitentiary to die off there. 10 million of us died in residential schools in BC. BC, in my hometown, we were from Nanaimo to Victoria to North Vancouver Island. Our villages were that close. We were this close. But the smallpox, the ships came, all that. But uh, what happened? We fed them, we shared, we showed how to clothe, we showed how to fish, we showed how, we didn't do it for them, and I see that in you. You're not doing it for me, you're teaching. You're giving me the tools to carry on. So I see progress here, and, and I see that, and I feel that uh, the, the, the hunger for Getting out of what we did is, is very pain, hunger pain. And I, and I uh, feel that uh, the, the food that we're fed as knowledge on here is not food of knowledge. You are. You'll use the tools to show us or how something's done. And I thank you because most, most, most of the cyber, cyber doesn't get along with the, uh, the natural governance. Each of us have natural governance where we're from. Now we're one family in Vancouver, not Samat. We're one international family. When I went to the hospital ward to pick up my great-granddaughter the other day, they said, uh, oh, stop, we're waiting for Mrs. White. And the mums adopted to a Cree family, a little half-breed white girl, so the baby's fair. And my grandson's dad's Portuguese, and his mum were sailors Haida and Hawaiian. And so by nature, they stopped me expecting a white woman to be walking in. And it stopped. On the family a lot. See the mentality? So I appreciate the, tr the, the truth that you're seeking and finding. And we appreciate that uh, the governance is getting to here. Not only on there, you know. My dad always said, technological. <laughs> Four foot eleven and a half, shall we say? <laughs> and now it's six foot three. Who's the boss? <laughs> Mom, grandma, and great grandma. So I feel that great grandma in you all. And we like to share our indigenous content. You know, I have records on the international market. It's a devious business, cyber. You know, I was telling James the other day, I sold a record, I sold a song, I didn't know I was selling a song. They asked for a compilation, and I said, oh, I'll join them. 
So then it's, they said, oh, 12% in handwriting. So what happened? They take the cyber machines, type it, get it back in the letter with a sealed stamp. 1.2% for the artists. So I'm not rich enough to go hire a lawyer against civil record companies. So I asked James, what if these wizards were going to, you guys, what if these wizards know about um, my kids went to play a video game and my song was on there, so someone stole my song again. So it's not a very honest gentleman or lady, the cyber. So appreciate the wealth of knowledge that you have and the attempt that you're addressing to cleanse the umbilical cord with truth, your truth. And we welcome that. Right from the Mother Earth. You know, some people say they treat us like dirt. They spit on us like we're dirt. Like that, you know. Yeah. But dirt is sacred. You know? It grows your food. The air, the land, the water is sacred. So I appreciate you, the way you're preparing to address that truth. And we celebrate your strength and everything we have, and some. We welcome you to your expertise to not amalgamate, but to not samat, join our indigenous knowledge. And with that, Cleansing of the umbilical cord, we honor you. Healing our nations of united resistance to apathy. And pride parades on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> All right, permission to speak? <laughs> I just said all this door. Sorry, I lost. Okay. <laughs> This is all. I, I do have a deck. Uh, I do have a linear progression. I'm trying not to digress, but things are about to get crazy. Um, the last year, so I, in, in the context, I, I just in meeting Marcus um, in that first intro round this morning. Uh, yes, what I do, and that's like a serious existential question. Um, I'm a stay-at-home dad largely, um, and I unschool my kids, um, and. Uh, uh, hit lots of powder days. Um, I'm easily pacified with my skis and my bike. Um, but I, I was invited through a connection with Carissa and Scott and having met Scott at another event uh, around the Occupy time, um, I was really excited to come to Partec 2017. Um, and lo and behold, uh, somebody brought up Ask Wicked Questions yesterday. Um, I did last year in a working group. I had like an agenda um, there, but I asked a question, um, this one, something like that, in a working group, knowing very little about blockchain, just recognizing that it was, um, you know, one of the big buzzwords. Um, and so I asked, can you program a blockchain with indigenous consensus protocols? Um, and, and I'm familiar with the, let's say, the lack of consensus on indigenous consensus protocols. Like it's an impossibility, really. But there is a process, uh, and it's probably a process we're all familiar with. When we convene in a circle, uh, we move aside our preconceived judgments and, and the notions that we, we hold, like our dog, our, I guess our, like, our firm dogmatic grounding. Um, and when we let go of those and we engage in dialogue, we make space for transformative solutions to emerge. And the, the ride I've been on over the last year since asking this question at Partec 17 has been truly remarkable. Like, I'm, I'm a hyper-rational physicist and mathematician um, in, in, in my training, um, which was very limited and unstructured. Um, <laughs> so, so, so I'm, I'm, yeah, anyway, anyway um, I, I have to acknowledge that, like, I'm not peer-reviewed at all. Um, <laughs> 
but the, uh, the but people who were took interest in this question. So Vicky Lemieux, uh, Dr. Vicky Lemieux, who's the, who unfortunately isn't here, but um, she, she was super excited about this as, as an archivist, this, this notion. Um, and we've been exploring it, and it has turned into a number of tangible proje projects, um, which, which I'll get into. Uh, so the, this, this was the name of the project, and it was supported by the Human Data Commons Foundation. And um, a number of folks, uh, James, who is, is ill today and, and couldn't be here. Um, so blockchain at UBC, Adiverse, so Tony and Mary Lou. And we have some pretty cool projects on the go. Uh, Reconciliation Dialogue is an initiative that, that I'm part of, um, where we ask the question, what does a post-colonial Canada look like? Uh, I work principally as a negotiator on behalf of First Nations, uh, which is I have a pretty big vocabulary and I speak white guy in rooms of white guys and lawyers um, to represent Indigenous interests. And um, I, I heard from uh, an indigenous teacher of mine that it's impossible to tell a lie in their language. You, you just can't structure a lie, um, but that English seems to be made for it. Um, <laughs> I always found that kind of funny. <laughs> um, and and I, ironically, like in, in terms of English, is a hybrid language that was developed in, uh, in Britain because it was an island amidst Europe. So it became a hybrid trading language. So maybe there's truth to that. Um, and then Hollow Chain and, and other folks. So there's a number of people in the room um, who've supported this project. And what's, what continues to emerge just blows my mind. So being back to uh, being a hyper-rational guy, um, you know, I, I throw out like skepticism and doubt and cynicism before everything. Um, and, and look for any opportunity to prove sort of higher design or, you know, like even the notion of a, a god or a creator. Like I, I just have a fundamental bias to, to, to doubt that. Um, I'm finding that really hard with how cool things continue to emerge, uh, including like Kelly coming and joining us and, and sort of taking on the role of our chief matriarch. So, um, this is a, a concept, the Mohawk Tawatu Huawi, and uh, during Idle No More, I read an academic paper around the notion of indigenous sovereignty, and the, the concept really touched me because it talked about how we're not just sovereign as nati nations, we're sovereign as individuals. And that sovereignty comes with it, the responsibilities to our kin, to other beings, to our community. And th there's an economy woven around that. And there's in academic work going into Coast Salish gift economy. Um, there's a, a really prominent um, economist in Van based out of Vancouver, but she's New Channel, Caroline Hinton, um, and her study is Indigenomics. She's currently advising our federal minister of finance. Um, so when, when we talk about birthing a new day, um, Canada, I think we, we're really kind of at the, at the leading edge of, of, of some, birthing something pretty cool. So sovereignty is achieved through harmonious relationships with those that we have a relationship to. And uh, there's a progression here, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it to that. Uh, th this will come up again, the notion of what, what is sovereignty. Uh, so I, I grew up in this region with a little puree up to the Yukon to really explore backwoods cynicism uh, in the 70s. Um, and, and I grew up in a little place called Brentwood Bay, which is like an amphitheater of a bay. And Brentwood College was this kind of colonial landmark and it had its Anglican church and old historic buildings on one side of the bay and on the other side of the bay was the res. And there was a big house there. And the big house drums and ceremony would carry through the bay. So as a, even as a hyper-rational um, child, I was captivated by the drum. 
Like it, it, it captivated my imagination. And I grew up in an environment where racial tension was a daily occurrence at our schools. Uh, racism was systemic. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm exploring the notion in, in my work uh, to, to do like a, a stand-up comedy tour um, <laughs> by the title of I'm Not Racist, But. Um, <laughs> which seems to be the precursor to our racist jokes. Um, anyway, I went to high school with three brothers whose dad was the president of the National Indian Brotherhood. And Kelly is, has been holding a torch for the indigenous sovereignty movement, which is really strong. And the resilience of our indigenous people um, is remarkable. It's truly remarkable. Uh, you know, when 90 to 95 percent of a population was wiped out by disease and, and what was an intact social structure whose icons returned to the earth and had an intimate understanding of Max Neef's satisfiers, like it, the, the economy, the, 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 the traditions, the learnings are what we need. They're like in this global meta crisis, the teachings are what we need. And there's a lot of stories that come, there are perennial stories across indigenous nations and the Hopi are, are most known for their prophecies, but most nations have very, very similar stories ab about a time when their teachings come to the fore. So uh, I, I really believe, and, and James says, because he's spiritual, um, we're on the creator's path. We're on the creator's path. Even though it's hard um, and there's easier things to do out there for money, let's, you know, we're on the creator's path. Which I'm still, like, I, I believe him, but. Um, so he, traveling back in time, imagine this landscape where the, the little villages of kinship groups were, sort of, you know, everywhere, dotted, like there was millions of inhabitants in this region. And there was a exchange in trade. And, and again, I'm certainly romanticizing life. Life was, was rough and brutal for everyone across the world at that time. And, and there's a lot of advances that we've made. Uh, but one thing I want to point out in this artist's rendition is the smokestack coming out of each of these houses. Because at the center of those houses was a fire. And around that fire, it was often the elders gathering. And this is where governance took place. This is where consensus mechanisms, consensus protocols were carried out. And it was a wisdom tradition, much like Buddhism, where people in, and again, it's not necessarily a religion, but it was a, a way of life cultivating the individual. Um, and, and it was an economy based on what you could give through potlatching. Because if you, you know, because our material attachments sort of take away from our connection to what's real and tangible. But in this progression, just keep in mind the smokestacks and that around a fire there was governance taking place. And, and you know, here is a, a language-based map of the continent and, and the nations and kinship groups were defined by common language and the, the, there was lots of exchange, like Hawaiians paddling across um, it, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, this is a, a photo of an Ugalikin. I took it on the ferry to Haida Gwaii and somebody had their truck full of it and he probably traded halibut. Um, but Ulikin was a smelt, is a smelt, sorry. And um, it, it comes at a certain time of year up the rivers and you can just like take a bun bunch out of them, you know, let it rot in a pit for three, four, five days and then you squish it and it boil it and pull the grease out and it's incredibly rich in nutrition. Uh, but the trade routes across the continent were called grease trails because the constituent, I, I would say, if we're trying to talk white guy, it's like the gold standard of indigenous trade. It was based on something that held 
profound nutrition that you could survive a like endure lots of hardship and famine through with this grease because it really I, I, like it doesn't taste that good <laughs> really does it <laughs> so but it, it, this is a notion that uh, it's always captivated my my imagination um, all right recognize this <laughs> Dr. Chris Rowell, could you tell me where this comes from? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, we know this. All right. So I think back to the smokestacks, to the little villages, the governance. Now, here's we're back on the Salish Sea, and and the governance was managed by distributed kinship networks essentially and what it was based on was protocols and there was so there's these perennial protocols that across language groups across you know different kinship groups people were still able to trade in exchange so because like if you have uh, you know if you live like at the mouth of one of these rivers, uh, uh, you know, Coast Salish were known for high art because, like, food pickings around here was pretty easy. Like, for you know, you just had to sit by the river and salmon would jump on your lap. <laughs> and, uh, but you might want like obsidian that comes from the insides of plateau, or for tools you might want, you know, or for art. And so there was. Lots of exchange and trade. Um, and, and this is the crescendo for all the crypto folks out there. Um, I think. <laughs> Can somebody explain to me what a DAO is? Anyone know? Of course somebody knows. Distributed. Distributed autonomous organization. So, uh, in, with the, so with the Ethereum blockchain, um, it, it, the, there, there is, um, through smart contracts and protocols, essentially, um, you can have a leaderless organization. Now, Chris, you, you talked a lot about that, the, the potential of this in, in more like, tangible, practical contexts. Um, and, and it's, so the project, what we've explored is, okay, what are these consensus protocols? Well, good luck with that is sort of what I heard. Um, now, Vicky Lemieux uh, has a student uh, who is just about to wrap up her master's in library and archival sciences, uh, Kristin Kozar. And Kristin is uh, Koselish, uh, and she is, um, going to lead the Chinook Foundation into the inquiry about how to codify indigenous consensus protocols. And they'll be unique and distinct for each kinship group. So, like a smart contract. But it, what it enables us to do is reflect traditional knowledge and teachings and create a structure and code whereby we can trade <laughs> with out trust or without using English to lie. <laughs> Not to totally debase, it's like I don't have any other languages really. So. Um, okay. And we've heard about seven generations. Um, one thing I think that's fascinating is that the American Constitution and, and a, many aspects of Canadians' cooperative federalism stemmed from the Iroquois Confederacy, uh, which is really actually the, you know, um, manifestation of democracy. So advances in, on the continent politically uh, arguably came from an indigenous understanding and that governance approach. Um, John Ralston Saul wrote about it quite elegantly in his 2008 book, A Fair Country. It's, it's well worth the read as a Canadian to understand um, how we are fundamentally a Métis nation. Um, and, and honoring our indigeneity is how we're going to fix this shit.
Um, okay, I'm gonna, things are, this is where things get weird. Um, I, I lived and worked in post-apartheid South Africa. Um, I, this is an article I wrote a number of years ago called Our Own Apartheid. Um, when I worked in South Africa, I was working with township youth. And I discovered in that process that Canada and the Indian Act was a design framework for apartheid. Uh, and there I was, self-righteous Canadian, going to save people who were oppressed, um, where I hadn't really dealt with our issues at home. Um, and as I mentioned, I was, well, I, I think I digress, but I, like, I was politicized to understand the indigenous sovereignty movement just by my high school friends who were very articulate and capable of explaining that no, that was their land. Um, and the, the state of treaties in Canada. Um, what I want to do now is get out of our heads. Um, I'll share a, a story. Um, is there time-wise? Are we super, okay. Um, I went to South Africa in 94 to work with Outward Bound. Uh, I worked with Outward Bound here um, and, and I was running youth programs and I, I continued to actually run an adventure therapy program for the youth prisons in BC. Um, and, and that's actually my background was, was ad adventure based experiences. Um, and I was working with township youth and I was supposed to take them canoeing on the Fish River. And, and I, this is how it starts. I stood knee deep in dilemma on the banks of the Fish River, trying to reconcile death threats hurled my way. My students were from Soweto, where violence had reigned supreme for decades and death threats were a daily occurrence. And, and really what was going on is the, these group of former militia um, in the struggle against apartheid uh, were using solidarity and death threats against me and my colleague who was an American person, woman, because um, we wanted to teach them to canoe, which was the programming. It was supposed to improve their lives and sense of self. And, and I was like, whoa, okay. Uh, and I had a pretty big bag of tricks as an educator, um, and I'd, I'd seen a lot of things working within the judicial system here. And, uh, but it was having grown up next to the res that kind of got me through. Um, and the, there's a tremendous sense of, a sense of humor with indigenous folks uh, and teasing. And um, I, my response to the death threat, so I was like, seriously? Like, I'm just some hippie kid from <laughs> BC who came from the other side of the world to teach you to canoe. Because canoeing, where I come from, was like how the indigenous people got around. And it's, it's pretty cool. Like in Canada, like everybody canoes. It's kind of like dancing in Africa. Uh, and in fact, I won't even teach you to canoe unless you can teach me to dance. Um, and at, at that point, the women in the group got up and started laughing um, and berating me. Um, and it was like, and, and all of a sudden the guys who were posturing violence were like, oh no, the women have stepped up. <laughs> oh. And the women, are, are, the, the women are, are, are so excited at the notion of trying to see that white guy dance. <laughs> This isn't, you know. So we, we, we scaled back the canoeing. We started with like blowing bubbles and like wading knee deep. Because uh, I recognized it was fear based and it wasn't like a culture that had swimming lessons. Um, and that night, the group uh, like uh, took out food out of coolers and turned over buckets to improvise drums. There was a hollow log of an old acacia tree that was found and there was an improvised percussion uh, ensemble. And there was a group of people on the sand by the, on the banks of the, the Fish River trying to teach me to dance. Um, and it was a profound experience for me. I, I was supposed to be the teacher in that environment and I, I was, was the person that, could, that, that learned 
from that experience. And, and the institutional knowledge for us in, in what was really a colonial school, Outward Bound, it came out of the UK, kind of like um, colon, colonialization, imperialism. Uh, and the, what, what we learned institutionally was we could do anything with our groups as long as we danced first. And, I, and I'm going to show I'm going to show a brief video here, and I, this is where things get weird, <laughs> or like just after. I'm really struggling with this. That's not it. I can't manage. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Although. Sorry, I'm apparently, I have to look up there to see where the mouse is. So maybe, maybe I'm going to skip this. Do you guys feel like going outside and dancing? <laughs> That wasn't an answer. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll skip it then. Uh, it was going to be super fun. Um, oh. yeah, it's going to be super fun. Bring it up on here and then we'll just drag it over. Hi. Of the Nelson Mandela tribute series on South African music, where you are going to learn about the toy toy. intention can raise the crypto market okay <laughs> but we can only do it with our knees so if you want to boost your crypto let's try it let's, let's let's make this a collective intention experiment I think we should go out in the yard I'll hop in between and if you really want to get badass you grab a shield and you pump the shield and you grab a spear Okay. <laughs> Cognitive bias and executive function disorder um, through teachings and ceremony from an elder that, you know, that I struggle with something that most white guys do. Uh, and that is that I just like am in my head. 
listening to the voice of my head and, and marginalizing the voice of my heart, which is more connected to the two feet that brought me here to the earth, to the, my ancestors. Um, and I think that's really important. And I'm, you know, in, in my inquiry uh, into, you know, improving myself and understanding stuff, uh, I've really become an advocate for um, sort of embodied consciousness and that our consciousness isn't just something that stems from the brain, that we act as a receptor of something that's all around us. Um, this is uh, just a, a long-term novel project that I've been working on, which traces, uh, the, it starts, South African character comes to Canada and talks about how racist we are. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll bring it to market sometime soon, um, when the time is right. So that's, I have to ask for, you know, the permission of the women to speak. Um, so, um, but it's a lot of the ideas that I brought forward into the what, what is now Chinook came from this. Um, so exploring notions of, of, of economies based on ulican exchange rather than gold and the, you know, essentially our fixation with bling um, and how we uh, in our modernist way, uh, fixate on material wealth and, and not necessarily relationship and, and how that impacts us uh, as a world at large. Um, in, in some of my earlier work, I, I mentioned I work as a negotiator on behalf of First Nations. I've worked in energy policy. Um, my work about 15 years ago with, branched into First Nations really trying to uh, develop renewable energy projects and transition. Um, and I, I did some work for the Climate Action Secretariat when BC was implementing its carbon finance um, regime. And uh, behind the scenes as a negotiator, I've been working with a collective of folks on how we can um, implement wide scale um, indigenous controlled uh, carbon markets and uh, through atmospheric benefit sharing agreements. And I've looked at the legal framework of how the assertion of indigenous territory can circumvent our established colonial government regimes. Um, and all of a stay at home dad, unschooling my kids. Um, so th th these are th the three kind of interrelated projects that have stemmed from the data sovereignty for indigenous sovereignty project. The Chinook Foundation and Chinook Exchange and something that's emerging sovereign data services. Chinook Foundation is uh, research and development around codifying indigenous consensus protocols led by Kristen Kozar. Um, it's uh, a colleague of mine has said, well, it has to be led by the antis. Um, and I'll explain how um, a little bit under the hood about how community indigenous politics works. Um, the men get to participate in the colonial Indian Act government where they're elected and fly around and think they're important. And often there's a, a circle of elders and the traditional governance that's taking place around fires, which is actually making the decisions. Um, and I am, yeah, this is something that, that I only see myself as a fire keeper for. Um, and I'm going to spend a lot of time convincing Kelly to be part of that matriarchal circle. Um, so the Chinook Foundation is modeled after, say, like the Ethereum Foundation or. Um, Linux Foundation in that it's research and development um, and, and focused purely um, on making sure the efficacy of what we do doesn't create harm. So it is to identify what the measures are for, and, and, and it has to be grassroots and authentic. 
So we are avoiding political association with uh, nations as, as they are defined under the Indian Act. Uh, and Chinook Exchange is the modeled really kind of after the Ethereum blockchain, um, although you know it may not be a, it may be post blockchain, um, as if I know what that means. Um, the idea is that we can create a value exchange that's based on in, indigenous value metrics or measures and not ones that are based on fee simple property, which is a notion that came out of English common law, um, which is the precursor to how we structure corporations and, and how we um, essentially build a legal framework where things can be owned, commodified, and exchanged. Um, it doesn't necessarily work when you have collectively owned assets that we are only sh share uh, stewards of for a period of time. So when you have a different ontology and belief system for the world around you, the colonial and imperial economic framework doesn't necessarily work at all. Um, so like, this is just, I ripped this off of Ethereum basically, but, um, and then just like added Chinook in my own adjectives. Uh, so, hey, open source, right? Um, <laughs> I'm getting really excited about this sovereign data services because um, there's a really cool, po well, is, it a, is it a possibility? There's something emerging uh, whereby data centers are being established on indigenous territory um, and because of the legal relationship and the ability to assert title um, and to, you can create a more robust uh, legal framework for privacy and security. Um, that wh whereby, so by pu putting those server stacks and then really ne networking them together, uh, we can take over. <laughs> in a good way, in a good way. <laughs> Not led by me, <laughs> it's led by Kelly. Okay, um, and I, this is me ripping off Banksy. Um, <laughs> I, I, I guess I gave him. Um, one of the challenges that we're having in implementing this is when, when you go and talk to people about blockchain, who's ever tried that? Yeah. How does it go? You know? They either want, you know, trading advice or they don't want to talk to you anymore. Um, the, I, I've been asked by some clients uh, about just having dabbled in technology, um, can you do something around suicide? Um, how, like how about an alert system uh, for suicide prevention? And uh, through the network of Partech, uh, there's been quite a bit of work to, and, and uh, Mary Lou and Tony and James and I are, are bringing together some interface design, um, really with the idea of, of getting users and creating a sovereign social interface. Um, so it's called Cuz, which when you say that in a room of indigenous people, you always get a laugh. Um, and, but where I grew up, they're always saying we're, we're all cousins. Um, like, no, literally, we are. Um, but then I meet Kelly yesterday, and it turns out, like, actually, like, we are cousins. It's weird, eh? Because we don't look alike. <laughs> Um, what, what we're looking at is, uh, and we're piloting um, part of this development with a group of indigenous youth to de design an interface, it, uh, and this is with Adiverse. Um, and we developed in, in the Chinook jargon um, something called Mamuk uh, Kumsums, uh, which is to make understanding in the Chinook dialect. Um, and for those who don't know, the Chinook dialect was a trade language in this area, the post-colonial, which was hybrid, um, so that you could not trade in English. 
So, um, from from the, the you know what I understand of the indigenous teachings and training is that each of us is brought here w with a purpose for a reason, and that it's our driving passion, and it's the the, the work that the world most needs. Um, and in an indigenous community, those qualities are identified and nurtured and supported. And it's the fire, kind of inside the big house, really. Like, that's, that's what we bring to governance. Not our inauthentic roles where we sort of fit within a fiefdom um, of church and state control. Um, excuse my cynicism. I, Still working on that. Um, but we want to ask these questions and create an interface that isn't for harvesting data or information, that it's purely for creating connections and what people need. Who wants, to, you know, we're not going to get a bunch of indigenous kids to sign up for a suicide watch app. But we're going to we're, we're going to be able to provide utility whereby they can um, you know in in a in a private way connect you know so you know who are you like you know what are you about because we're going to keep that flame alive that's what we're planning to do here and who do you need around your fire you know who's your cousin that you can talk to if you've just shot up and you're scared. Like those, are, like that's what's real, right? It's it's not, uh, and and that you can do so privately and and be supported and um, and and who's going to like say, yeah, yeah, no, you've fallen back, but you need to get up. This is what you bring to the world. Like you matter. Um, so this is something that we're working on, and we feel like, okay, you do something useful like that, you get users, cool, then we can onboard them onto our blockchain interface and have them trade in, 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 you know, in Chinook Tala, uh, but that's down the road. Um, so I'm, I'm wrapping up here, and I just want to talk a little bit about the emergence theory, and uh, spend a little bit of time with our... our um, academic presenters yesterday um, in putting my citations in. Um, but emergence is the arising of novel coherent structures, patterns and properties during the process of self-organization in complex systems. More simply, the whole is greater than its synergy. And, and I think this is what's, what's cool. Whole, like, okay, so in the room, we're Partech 2018. Um, we're the parts of that, but it's the interactions. And it was these interactions, it was last year, like this whole project stemmed from me coming and asking a question, which I thought was kind of a silly, dumb question, naive perhaps, because I didn't have, I, I didn't work in the realm of that, I didn't have any expertise in that realm. And I, I still don't really, um, uh, although I'm more informed. Um, so, watch out today. <laughs> you might end up being part of something big. Um, I'm super excited about this work and I've shared it with a few folks. Um, it's a mathematical uh, a professor, Martin Nowak, and he, I don't know, he's been to all sorts of big universities like Oxford and but the, uh, these are the five rules of evolution cooperation, and each of them has a mathematical theorem, um, which are great for parsing uh, points within a code structure. Um, and, and this is a way where we can reduce mathematically, uh, and one of his colleagues works here and is actually a friend of Vicky Lemieux. Um, so with the Chinook Foundation, we aspire to actually codify and express mathematically. Um, these consens the, the consensus mechanisms that will save us all. Um, and and I, so, unfortunately, James was sick, and James sort of came to the project uh, just after uh, the idea inception, and, and has been working with me since and continues to. Um, and we're. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get busy. I tend to lay low and be a bit of a recluse, but um, I, I, I think it's time to open up and go public um, as long as Kelly gives me permission. <laughs> so um, thank you. And, and questions? Oh, yeah, Dave. Sounds so great. Yeah. Um, just being with you in the front of the room, there's such an amazing gestalt to all this. And you know, I'm around tech a lot, 
in business, and I'm always listening for a commitment. You know, what is right. this person really committed to generating? Um, it feels like there's so many pieces here that align beautifully. Um, the question that I have is, well, first, you know, what is the scope of this when it's successful? Yeah. Like, what does that look like? And if it does include the world, yeah. of course it will exclude some because not everybody has access. But when it's successful, how, uh, like imagine the typical cliche Trump voter. I tend to think if you want to change the world, you got to get them on board. Us liberals, oh yeah, we're in, right? For sure, yeah. But if you want the world to shift, yeah. that community of people who, yeah. well, let's not even define them, you know what I'm talking about. Right. They need to see themselves in this. Yeah, I, I actually don't think that Trump voters are uh, cognitively like uh, self-reflective, um, and I, you know, I, I think that we as a species are fundamentally stupid. Uh, I, like, I, honestly, like, I, yeah, I've only prepared for the apocalypse, and I'm still waiting for my <laughs> skills to be relevant. Um, the success. Sorry for ranting cynically, but I'm sure you've got agreement in this room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? It, yeah, there's, there's. So, you, uh, and I really love your question. Um, the scope of it in terms of success. Um, you know, we we look at the satisfiers of Manfred Maxneefs, and and we look at Joseph Stiglitz's economic metrics, so that we change GDP. To me, this is the silver bullet. Um, we have a legal framework in Canada that started with the Royal Proclamation of 1763, whereby indigenous nations could federate and create a utopic, like a tech utopia. Um, the bridge to that is hard because these are people who are living in poverty, who've been beaten down and are still being beaten down, not just by our police, but by commerce itself, right? Um, and so, but it provides the, 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 the victory, the, I, the success is that we don't all move to Mars. So I'm undermining Elon Musk's exit plan here. Um, but I, I like this planet. Um, so it's really, I think, with when we're going back to the Trump voter, if we recreate how we measure value, so that it's not pseudo satisfiers or violators, like we, we really have an economy based on violators with this assumption of selfish self-interest. And Adam Smith was a super smart guy, but he wrote that around the time of the Royal Proclamation, like 70, 1774, I think that was published, The Wealth of Nations. So th these are draconian ideas that we're fixed to. And, and, and the, but the script behaviors of us exchanging uh, uh, you know, money in commerce can be changed if we fundamentally change how we measure value so that we don't have negative externalities built into the structures of our commerce. So we're locked in a modern, modern, like modern structure, kind of in, in, in not just in the, you know, in social science, but in the integral, there's a lot of, you know, people more articulate than me, um, on, on how we've got this prevailing modernist view of mechanized commerce that isn't a full picture view. So if we update that and Trump voters are spending that money, we can game Trump, we can game his voters. So is it liberals? I think it's all of us, right? Um, I don't know how well I did at answering your question. Um, I, uh, Alicia and I were talking about this, and Darlene and I yeah. made yesterday over lunch. You gotta sell them something that they'll grab onto. Yeah. Like maybe right now that is kind of by a lady. Uh, I don't know. I just don't know what it looks like. Yeah. I think for any of us to be successful in this pursuit of tech for good, we have to find that core that rings with people who don't think about this stuff like we do. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. I'd love to know what, well, each, each one of us is pursuing that thing, right? Yeah. We, how do we get the mainstream? 
Yeah, 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 on, onboarding the mainstream. And, and I, I think it's like change, like, so yeah, with Chinook, I would like to have, like, replace our form of currency by and large. Um, but, you know, I'm looking at that in a British Columbia context because of the unique um, le legal cauldron that we have here. Um, and, and I have those global aspirations. Um, but I'm finding there's way too much stuff on the ground for me to take that on, right? Like there's a lot going on here. Um, yeah, Kelly? Just for example, um, um, the community radio broadcasters, uh, a minute sample of the radio broadcasters in Quebec and Vancouver in the 80s, were, were pirated, they pirated old stations and started with radio in Vancouver at the first world, at the first courthouse that was shut down by ceremony. A lot of our people were killed there. Environmentalists and lawyers broke the chains of that at Pigeon Square and opened a pirate radio station in Vancouver that's now known as Co-op Radio. And in Quebec, the same thing happened with the environmental, environmental law and religious groups called pirated radio station. Now, Quebec hosted AMARC, World Indigenous Radio Broadcasters, and there was two of us then in the early 80s. Um, then we were community education radio uh, as well as on campus and in colleges and universities, and now, uh, there were 111 radio stations from two that started, and we're in hiatus. The stations are in hiatus for nonprofit societies funding currently. But from Quebec and Vancouver, two stations that started with the unity of four or five people each, we now celebrate world radio broadcasters, like over almost 3,000 world education radio broadcasters, and. And for us, it's not the money, it's the knowledge. When we run on a nonprofit society, because they come and go, but we're still here, right? Mm -hmm. So we maintain the grounds. And then we pursued uh, the first time in the country, Indigenous were allowed in, permitted to be in TV and film by our protest for 10 years. We went to the three levels of government, uh, municipal, provincial, and national, to protest that we deserve to be in technology also, TV and film director and producers. That wasn't allowed, so we went and asked, told the universities in North Vancouver, thanks for our enrollment. We have students that we have uh, uh, involved from New Brunswick to Vancouver directors and producers. So we took it on ourselves to go to Catalan College and many mass, we thanked them in an honorable fashion, had a feast and giveaway, and then next Two years later, they enrolled the Indigenous for the first time in the year 2000. It's all about you deliver. <clears throat> so, you know, we ask and we ask for nowhere. So we thank them, in essence, telling them, if you have permission to listen to our Indigenous content, you know, because there's more ways to protest than one, right? To sub subservience the air uh, uh, listenership. That's one example. So cyber, you know, it's a must. The truth of all is from one umbilical cord, so it's inevitable and indigenous people of the world to you know, join the cyber world. It's not the money you can, you know, it's the honor. I'm grateful that you don't hear anything that happens. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's good. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much for um,